Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Attorney General Sessions, thanks for being here. General Sessions, who do you work for? Do you work for the American people or do you work for the President of the United States? Well, I'm a member of the um, executive branch and I work for the American people. Uh, and it's with that in mind, your work on behalf of the American people, that I want to ask you some questions about facts and public media reports. On February 14th, the President asked the FBI director about the Flynn investigation, and I quote, he said, I hope you can see your way clear to letting this go, to letting Flynn go. He's a good guy. I hope you can let this go, close quote. Then on May 9th, the president fired Comey. On May 11th, he went on television and announced that he fired Comey because of, and I quote again, the Russia thing with Trump and Russia, close quote. General Sessions, do you think it would be reasonable for the members of this committee to conclude that the president, by first interfering in one investigation and then interfering in an investigation into himself, committed obstruction of justice? I don't um, believe that's a fair conclusion, and um, I would, but it's a matter that I guess would be in the breast of the special counsel. Uh, and uh, the obstruction of justice being any, among other definitions, the most popular one uh, in statute, any communication that endeavors to influence, obstruct, or impede the due administration of justice, that's exactly, that's exactly what the president did in both of those cases. And in spite of moving on to uh, the special counsel that you brought up, in spite of efforts, bipartisan efforts, to protect the special counsel, uh, Mr. Mueller, the Republican leadership and this committee have refused to, to take action to ensure that he's protected. Do you believe that the president has the legal authority to fire Special Counsel Mueller? I'm not able to express an okay. opinion on that. Can he fire members of the Special Counsel's team? I'm not able, I, I, I'm not able to uh, answer General, that. General Session, do you believe that the president should have the authority to be able to block investigations into his own campaign? Investigations have to be conducted by the appropriate law enforcement officers without uh, fear and favor, without politics or bias. Right, and without fear of being dismissed by the president in order to block that investigation, because again, that would certainly appear to represent <clears throat> obstruction of justice. And when you fail to acknowledge that, uh, it is essentially a green light to the president to go ahead and do that. And now, I wanted to talk about the special counsel's investigation. Thus far, there have been some indictments. There's a guilty plea. Uh, can you tell me, in your opinion, does the president have the power to pardon George Papadopoulos? Uh, I would be uh, premature for me to uh, comment on that, I believe. Uh, because the president has power to uh, pardon. There's no doubt about that. Right. Would you be, would, does he have the power to pardon uh, Paul Manafort and Rick Gates ahead of a trial and a conviction? I would, I'm not able to comment on that. I haven't researched that question. I'm sure, I think it's settled, maybe settled law, but I'm not. What do you think the settled law is? I don't know. And does he have the power to pardon Michael Flynn, any other member of the Trump campaign? Let me ask you this. Does the president have the power to pardon his own family members? Would the, could the president today pardon Donald Trump Jr. for, among other things, uh, being in contact with WikiLeaks regarding these emails. Can, can he make those pardons today before there's anything further that comes from the special counsel's investigation? I would not be able to answer that at this moment with any authority. Uh, General Sessions, you, you started by telling us that you're the American people's lawyer. Now, you're not recused from giving us answers on these. You're not comfortable giving us answers on these. But here's the problem that we have. You said when you started your testimony today that there is nothing more important than advancing the rule of law. And when you answer the way you have, it suggests that the rule of law is crumbling at our feet. You took an oath to uphold the Constitution. We took an oath to uphold the Constitution. And while members of this committee and the majority may choose to abdicate their responsibility with regard to these very important matters, you cannot. And the interference, what, what you've told us today in just this exchange, what we should all be concerned about is another Saturday Night Massacre, if you can't tell us that the president uh, shouldn't fire or can fire the special counsel and, and everyone who works for him. We should be worried 
if you're telling us that the president may be able to pardon in advance all of those who are being investigated, we should be worried about the pursuit of the rule of law. Uh, General Sessions, Let me, again, we, we may in this committee. The time of the gentleman has expired. The Attorney General can respond. If well, well so. just briefly, one of the yeah. things, if you respect the rule of law, is the Attorney General should not be uh, giving legal opinions from the seat of his britches. Oh, so you need to be careful about that, and that's what I'm saying to you today. I, I do I'm, appreciate I'm that, General Sessions. Expired. These are not new issues that, that I would think require you to Texas, give these Mr. opinions Poe. from the rule of your Thank bridges. you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. I Sessions, back. I'm over here on this side. Um, <laughs> Mr. Chairman, before I begin, I think I have a solution that could allow the committee to move on to other important national matters like gun control and immigration. Your side clearly wants an investigation of Hillary Clinton. And our side has been begging for months to hold hearings and start an investigation of the Trump administration and campaigns in proper ties to Mr. Putin and the Russian government. My solution would save the American taxpayers a lot of grief and a lot of money by eliminating the need for the investigations. I propose we simply go to the president and the former secretary of state and ask them both to resign. I'll go to Hillary Clinton, you can go to Donald Trump, and we'll say them both to resign. Then we can move on as a nation from an election that just never seems to end. Now, I did Google organizations that Hillary Clinton leads, and it came out zero. Uh, so I'm not quite sure what you're going to get her to resign from, because she doesn't appear to be in charge of anything. Last time I checked, she got three million more votes than Donald Trump, but she lost the election. So I don't know why don't we move on and really look at the nation. So, Attorney General... I'd like to ask you, you said earlier today it was a brilliant campaign referring to the Donald Trump campaign. Is that true? You feel that? It was a, a remarkable thing that overcame a lot of obstacles. Remarkable, brilliant campaign. When now, people couldn't have, in campaigns, uh, can, candidates make promises during campaigns. You, you think candidates should fulfill the promises they make during campaigns? People make a lot of promises, but, and but you, you think should they should fulfill those to, promises. It was a brilliant uh, campaign, honor your remarkable promises. campaign. And, as a member of the cabinet of, 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 of President Trump, do you feel an obligation to fulfill those campaign promises? I mean, when he asked you to come on, did you think you should fulfill the campaign promises? I, I believe the attorney general uh, should um, enforce the law first I, I and understand foremost. enforce the law, but he said he wanted, you're helping him on the Muslim ban, on immigration issue. I mean, you think he should fulfill President those promises? President makes decisions, and if it's lawful, we okay, defend it. If it's lawful. If it's lawful. Okay, I like that, that, if it's lawful. But you said it was a remarkable and brilliant campaign. He said, quote, during the second debate, if I win, I'm going to instruct my attorney general, that would be you, because he chose you, to get a special prosecutor to look into your situation, referring to Hillary Clinton, because there's never been so many lies, so much deception, end quote. And when Hillary Clinton uh, responded, she said, because you'd be in jail. Are you going to fulfill that campaign promise I'm that going he to made during the second debate? Because he did say he'd put her in jail. He said he asked the attorney general, you, to set a special promise. That's what he said. It's a quote. I didn't make it up. What do he say? Are you going to keep that campaign promise? I'll fulfill my responsibilities. You're gonna the are you going to keep the campaign promise? Is yes or no? It's a promise that your boss... He hired you to fulfill. Are you going to fulfill? We will comply uh, with the law uh, with regard to special prosecutor appointments. You, are you going to appoint one, as he promised during the campaign? Uh, He's reminded you a couple of times in a few uh, of his uh, tweets that that's what he wants you I'll to do. I'll fulfill my duty as attorney general. Okay. So the brilliant campaign, remarkable campaign, big smile on your face. You love the campaign, but you're not going to fulfill his campaign promises? I hope you don't in this particular case. <laughs> so I'm, I'm kind of happy with your answer up to now. So as a, uh, Mr. Attorney General, I'm <laughs> going to ask you another series of questions. And I'd like to go back to the beginning of the hearing and get you to answer the following question. Uh, are, are you aware that you are under oath and that your answers must be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, Mr. Attorney General? I'm aware of that. Okay, good. So I, I brought this little salt shaker here. And you'll forgive me if I just put a little bit of doubt into that answer. And just to remind myself that I might need this. And I ask unanimous consent that this article from Mother Jones Magazine be entered into the record with the headline, Three Times Jeff Sessions Made False Statements Under Oath to Congress. I ask this because I don't want to hear in a few days 
or in a few weeks that your answers, Mr. Attorney General, have changed based on newly uncovered evidence that what you told us before was in fact false, misleading, or something other than the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. I ask unanimous consent. That objection be made a part of the record. Thank you. Under oath, in the Senate, you said, as a surrogate, quote, a time or two for the Trump campaign, you did not have communication with Russians, but in March, it was revealed you did. Did you have campaign communications with the Russians? Because it appears you have had campaign communications with the Russians, Mr. Attorney General. That is, um, I'd like to respond to that. I thought I had the well, paper right here. Um, and um, surely, I do. Here it is. Mr. Chairman, take a couple the, of minutes. I'd like to respond, respond to, the to that. Colleagues, I guess say former colleagues. Um, they left. Senator there. Franken asked me this question. Uh, okay, CNN has just published a story, and I'm telling you about a new story that's just been published. I'm not expecting you to know whether or not it's true, but CNN just published a story alleging that the intelligence community of the United States of America, uh, the intelligence community provided documents to the president-elect last week that included information that, quote, Russian operatives claim to have compromising personal and financial information about Mr. Trump, close quote. These documents also allegedly say, quote, there was a continuing exchange of information during the campaign between Trump's surrogates and intermediaries for the Russian government, close quote. He goes on to say, now again, I'm telling you, this is all coming out, so you know, but if it's true, it's obviously extremely serious, and if there is any evidence that anyone affiliated with the Trump campaign communicated with the Russian government in the course of this campaign, what will you do? I was taken aback by this. I'd never heard of this. This happened while I was testifying, I suppose, and I said, Senator Franken, I'm not aware of any of those activities. I have been called a surrogate a time or two in the campaign, and I didn't have, did not have communications with the Russians, and I'm unable to comment on it. And you're not going to correct that today? I, my answer was responsive to his charge about a continuing... But do you uh, want to correct it or clarify it today for us? I, I'm the time of the gentleman has expired. The Attorney General can answer the question, but then we're moving on. So this is really important. I appreciate the opportunity to share it. So my focus was on responding to the concern that I, as a surrogate, was participating in a continuing uh, series of uh, meetings with intermediaries for the Russian government. And uh, I certainly didn't mean I'd never met a Russian in the history of my life. So I didn't think, to, uh, didn't think it was responsive, and my response uh, was, according to the way I heard the question, is honestly I could give it at the time. I hope you'll treat me fairly when you evaluate that. Mr. Attorney General, following up on the questions from Mr. Uh, uh, Conyers, at your confirmation hearing you said, I believe the proper thing for me to do would be to recuse myself from any questions involving these kinds of investigations that involve Secretary Clinton and that were raised during the campaign or to be otherwise connected to it, close quote. Do you stand by that statement, yes or no? Yes. Thank you. Now, I want to show you an image from March 31st, 2016 of a meeting of the Trump campaign National Security Advisory Committee, which you chaired, with yourself in attendance, along with then-candidate Donald Trump and Mr. George Papadopoulos. Mr. Papadopoulos pled guilty on October 5th to making false statements to the FBI. The charging papers filed by Special Counsel Mueller described the March 31st meeting where Mr. Papadopoulos told the group that he had connections and could help arrange a meeting between Donald Trump and Vladimir Putin. After the meeting, Mr. Papadopoulos continued to communicate with the Russian government on behalf of the Trump campaign and appears to have told several senior campaign officials about it. Now, here's the problem. On October 18th of this year, you said under oath in front of the Senate Judiciary Committee, quote, a continuing exchange of information between Trump's surrogates and intermediaries for the Russian government did not happen, at least not to my knowledge and not with me. Senator Franken asked, you don't believe that surrogates from the Trump campaign had communications with the Russians, to which you responded, 
I did not, and I'm not aware of anyone else that did, unquote. Now, we now know that, one, the campaign had, communi had communications with the Russians through Mr. Papadopoulos and others, and two, you seem to have been aware of the fact at the time. So let's try and correct the earlier testimony now for the record. Yes or no? Did you chair the March 31st, 2016 meeting of the National Security Advisory Committee? I did chair that Thank meeting. You. Did Mr. P yes or no? Did Mr. Papadopoulos mention his outreach to the Russian government during that meeting? He made some comment to that effect, yes, as I you. remember I, after I having to, I read it in the yes newspaper. I asked for yes or no. I don't have time. Yes, all right. There are reports that you shut George down, in, unquote, when he proposed that meeting with Putin. Is this correct, yes or no? Yes. I Thank pushed you. back, I'll just say it that way, because it was... Um, oh, you, yes. Your answer yes. is yes. So you were obviously concerned by Mr. Papadopoulos' connections and his possibly arranging a meeting with Putin. Now, again, yes or no, did anyone else at that meeting, including then-candidate Trump, react in any way to my, what Mr. Papadopoulos had presented? I don't recall. Okay, so your testimony is that neither Donald Trump nor anyone else at the meeting expressed any interest in meeting the Russian president or had any concerns about communications between the campaign and the Russians. I don't recall it. Okay. Now, we know from multiple sources, including the Papadopoulos' guilty plea, Carter Page's interview with the Intelligence Committee, and Donald Trump Jr.'s emails, among others, that contrary to your earlier testimony, there were continued efforts to communicate with the Russians on behalf of the Trump campaign. We have established that you knew about at least some of these efforts. They caused you such concern that you, quote, shut George down. I want to know what you did with this information. Yes or no? After the March 31st meeting, did you take any steps to prevent Trump campaign officials, advisors, or employees from further outreach to the Russians? Mr. Nadler, that, let me just say it this way. I pushed back at that. You made statements that he but did. did in fact, at the meeting, I pushed back. You know that. But did uh, you, after the no, meeting? No, I'm not. I have to be able to answer. I can't, I can't uh, be able to uh, no, be put in a position where I, I can't explain. Minutes. I'm asking you. I'm not going to be able to answer if I can't answer completely. But you said you pushed back. We accept that. After the meeting, did you take any further steps uh, to prevent Trump campaign officials, advisors, or employees from further outreach to the Russians after you stopped it or pushed back at that meeting? What I want to say to you is you allege there were some further contacts later. I don't believe I had any knowledge of any further contacts, okay. and I was not in regular contact with Mr. Papadopoulos. So your answer is no because you don't think there were any such contacts. So you did I'm not aware of it. Okay. So I, I was going to ask you a question of did you raise the issue with various people, but your answer is no. To the best of my recollection. Okay. Um, so your testimony today is that you communicated with nobody in the campaign about this matter after the March 31st meeting because nothing happened. Repeat that. Your testimony, therefore, is that you communicated with nobody in the campaign about this matter after the March 31st meeting. I don't recall it. You don't recall. At some point, you became aware that the FBI was investigating potential links between the Trump campaign and the Russian government. After you became aware of the investigation, did you ever discuss Mr. Papadopoulos' effort with anybody at the FBI? Did I discuss the matter with the FBI? Yes. To ask them questions about what they may did have you found? you discuss the Papadopoulos question with the FBI? I have not um, had any discussions with Mr. Mueller or his team or the FBI concerning any factors with regard and to nobody this else at the FBI either? No. At the Department of Justice? No. At the White House? No. Uh, any member of Congress? Well, uh, I don't know if these conversations may have come up at some time, but not to obtain information. In any, let, okay. With regard to your broad question, I don't recall at this moment, sitting here, any such discussion. Okay. I have one for it's the important time for me to say expired. that. The time the of the question. gentleman has expired. We've got a lot of people waiting to ask questions. Thank you, sir. Mr. Attorney General, first, uh, I noted you went to the 50th anniversary of the Selma, Alabama March, Selma Montgomery. Yes. I commend you for that, and you were a sponsor of the gold medal for those folks that marched. Uh, having done that, I would like to ask you, what have you done as Attorney General to see to it that African Americans and others who have been discriminated for years in voting have more access to the ballot box? We will absolutely, resolutely defend the right of all Americans to vote, including our African-American brothers and sisters. It cannot ever what? be suggested that uh, 
people are blocked from voting. And we have uh, done a number of things uh, in the Department of Justice. Let me ask you this, Mr. Attorney General. It's, it's a fact, there have been studies to show that voter ID is more discriminatory in its effect on African Americans and Latinos than anything else. Will you stop in defending voter ID law cases? No. Um, the Supreme Court has approved voter ID if properly done. Other courts have too. It can be done in a discriminatory way, which is not proper and should not be approved. Let but me I ask believe it's settled law that, it, that a properly handled and written voter ID law is, is Let me awful. suggest to sir, with all due respect, we come from the similar region. I think we have a greater responsibility than anybody else in this country to see to it that African Americans get a chance at the ballot. When they were discriminated against, they were slaves for 200 and plus years, they were under Jim Crow, they weren't allowed to vote, and they're still being discriminated against. And I would submit to you and ask you to look at voter ID laws, access to the ballot, election day voting, early voting, and other indices that will allow people to vote that have been stopped. Secondly, on marijuana, you said that, that you are basically doing the same as Holder and Lynch. I believe General Holder and General Lynch ab abided by congressional appropriations that limited the Justice Department in enforcing marijuana laws where states had passed laws on medical marijuana and others. Uh, are you, will you abide by congressional appropriations, limitations on marijuana when it conflict with state laws? I believe we're bound by that. Um, Thank you, sir. That's, that's great. That's great. And I saw you, you, what you did on crack cocaine was good. It wasn't as good as it could have been. Your proposal was a 20 to 1 ratio. Mr. Durbin's was a 10 to 1 ratio. Y'all decided on 18 to 1. You were a good negotiator, but Mr. Durbin took what he could get. But it should have been 1 to 1. But you, you, you admitted in that hearing that it could discriminate against the, the disparity against African Americans and minorities, and you ought to look at that. I would, well, I would just say th that the net effect of that legislation was to significantly it was good, reduce uh, the uh, penalty one is subjected to for uh, dealing with crack cocaine. Yes, sir, and that was good. That may be a better uh, analysis than the 18 to 1 or whatever it is. It's generally considered a more dangerous drug. Marijuana is not as dangerous as heroin. Would you agree with that? I think that's correct. Well, thank you, sir. I would hope that in your enforcement that you would look at the limitations you've got. There's always an opportunity cost, and put your opportunity cost, your enforcement on, mar on, on crack, on cocaine, on meth, on opioids, and on heroin. Marijuana is the least bothersome of all. 28 states or 29 states in the District of Columbia have legalized it for medical purposes. Eight states in the District of Columbia for recreational purposes. Justice Brandeis famously said that the states are the laboratories of democracy. I would hope you'd look at marijuana and look at the states as laboratories of democracy and see how they've helped. In states where they've got medical marijuana, they have 25% less opioid use. It gives people a way to relieve pain without using opioids, which inevitably leads to death and crime. And so I would hope you take a look at that. We will take a look at it, and we'll be looking at some rigorous analysis of uh, the marijuana uh, usage and how it plays out. I'm not as uh, optimistic as you. you. You said one time that good people don't smoke marijuana. Which of these people would you say are not good people? Well, let me answer, explain how that I, occurred. All right. And I explain? Quickly. Uh, John, Kasich, I talked John about, Kasich a good person? George Pataki, Rick Santorum, Newt Gingrich, Ted Cruz, Jeb Bush, George Bush, Arnold Schwarzenegger, or Judge Clarence Thomas? Which of those are not good people? Let me tell you how that came about, Congressman. Mm -hmm. Uh, so the question was, what do you do about drug use, the epidemic we're seeing in the country, and how you reverse it? Part of that is a cultural thing. I explained how, when I became United States Attorney in, in 1981, uh, and the drugs were being used widely, over a period of years, it became unfashionable unpopular and people were seen and it was seen as such that good people didn't use marijuana. What that was the those? context of that statement. It might have affected Time the short-term memory. Expired. What years were those? Do you recognize the gentleman? <laughs> One last Ohio, question, Alabama or Auburn? The, the gentleman. War Eagle. <laughs> Time.
has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I apologize in advance, Mr. Attorney General. I'm going to try to go through some questions quickly. Multiple trustworthy reports revealed last week that the Justice Department may require AT&T to sell CNN, among other assets, as a requirement for the approval of its proposed acquisition of Time Warner. Subsequently, more reports have surfaced that Rupert Murdoch, the chairman of 21st Century Fox and a confidant of President Trump, has twice contacted AT&T in an effort to buy CNN. This is, of course, very disturbing to those of us that are responsible for oversight of, uh, of these issues. And my first question is, has any White House employee or official, including the President, contacted the Justice Department regarding the AT&T Time Warner transaction or any other transaction? I'm not able to comment on conversations or communications the Department of Justice top people have with top people at the White House. Well, you, Mr. Chairman, I'd ask the witness to be directed to answer the question. You, you, you either you're invoking the Fifth Amendment or you're invoking executive privilege. You just can't decline to answer because it's uncomfortable. So I'd ask Mr. Chairman that the witness be directed to answer my question. Mr. The witness can answer the question in the fashion that he has determined. Um, well, we're reserving my right, Mr. Chairman, and I'll move on. <coughs> Mr. Sessions, are you not going to answer the question? Whether any White House or any White House officials have attempted to interfere or speak to the Justice Department about this transaction? According to longstanding Department of Justice policy, the Department of Justice does not reveal uh, comfort. Uh, Privileged conversations okay, I'm or reclaiming conversations my time then, Mr. between Mr. the White House I'm going to and move on to a new area. The, the Foreign Agents Registration Act, you're familiar with it? Right. You think it's good policy? I think it's a, a, a you, good law. It, you enforce it, correct? It has value, yes. In addition to Paul Manafort and Michael Flynn, have any other Trump campaign advisors or senior administration officials lobbied for foreign governments without disclosing it under the Foreign Agent Registrations Act? I'm not able to comment on that. And Why not? Repeat the question. Perhaps I misunderstood it. In addition to Paul Manafort and Michael Flynn, have any Trump campaign advisors or senior administration officials lobbied for foreign governments without disclosing it under the Foreign Agent Registration Act? That would be a matter that should be directed to Mr. Mueller, I believe. Uh, moving to a new question. On October 6th, the Department of Justice, actually you, on the behalf of the Department of Justice, issued a 25-page memo to all federal agencies purporting to provide guidance on religious liberty protections under federal law. In the guidance, you direct, you indicate that an exemption or accommodation for religious organizations from anti-discrimination law might be required even where Congress has not expressly exempted religious organizations. You remember that, right? Yes. Okay. Would that mean, under your interpretation, that an employee of FEMA could refuse to provide disaster assistance to an unmarried couple who live together based on the employee's religious belief that men and women should not cohabitate before marriage? I don't so believe no. that it could be interpreted that way. It's just would, a policy document. Would, we didn't try to write it. I, I really like well, I just you have to answer. Would, oh, this gosh. is a yes or no. Would the guidance you provided permit a HUD-funded shelter to refuse to house an unmarried pregnant woman based on the grant recipient's belief that that sex outside of marriage is a sin? Every, yes or no? Every matter. Uh, first, I, I don't think so, number one, under the guidance. But also, the guidance does not repeal established laws that are in place. And it was written, that guidance was, to uh, clarify the established thank, principles thank you, of Mr. religious Sessions. I have very freedom. limited time. I appreciate your answer. Well, now, returning you. to the Papadopoulos issue. In your October 18th testimony, you purport to have forgotten this conversation about, uh, by Mr. Papadopoulos about Russia that you put an end to. You said you weren't being dishonest, you weren't being, making a false statement, you simply forgot it. Remember that testimony? Something like that, okay. yes. When did you remember the remarks of Mr. Papadopoulos? When, when did that memory come back to you? I think it was when it, the press came up with it, or some, it, it was revealed in the press. That was the first time you remembered it? Just from, uh, I would recall that my October uh, statements uh, was a, a broad question. No, I understand. Mr. And Sessions, that I have it, a limited uh, time reclaiming this event my time. Occurred you were a over, senior, Mr. Sessions, you were a it was senior over 18 campaign months official before. and a member of the national security team. Did you ever exchange any email, text message, or any other communication to or from Mr. Papadopoulos about Russia or any other subject? Repeat the category, list of things. Exchange any email, text message, or any communication to or from Mr. Papadopoulos about I any do, subject. I, I, I do not believe so. I'm confident. I, I, Did any 
I did not. Did anybody no. ever forward to you a communication from Mr. Papadopoulos? I don't recall it. Did anybody from the campaign ever communicate with you about Mr. Papadopoulos? I can't say that there were no conversations about him uh, before or after this event. Were you told about I the did push back at the time him, of the I gentleman think. has expired. The witness can answer the question. Um, Chair, I don't have a specific recollection, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I'd ask to make a unanimous consent request. Uh, I would ask unanimous consent to insert the following materials into the record. A letter from me and Ranking Member Conyers requesting a hearing on the President's interference with antitrust enforcement matters before the Justice Department. A letter from Senators Amy Klobuchar, Diane Feinstein, and several others to the Justice Department urging it to oppose any attempt by the White House to interfere with antitrust laws, enforcement decisions, particularly for political reasons. A July article in the New York Times reporting that senior White House advisors have discussed using the AT&T Time Warner merger as a potential point of leverage over CNN. And nine letters from as far back as February of this year from various members of the Judiciary Committee seeking information on a wide range of subjects uh, addressed to the Attorney General of the United States that have been ignored, that we have received no response from. I ask those Without questions. objection, the document made part of the record. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Attorney General, President Trump has called the press the enemy of the people, although I think the founders probably thought that a free press was the people's best friend. As Attorney General, will you commit not to prosecute investigative journalists for maintaining the confidentiality of their professional sources? I will commit to uh, respecting the, the role of the press and uh, conducting uh, my office uh, in a way that respects that and the rules within the Department of Justice. But nothing specific. We have not had a conflict in my term in office yet with the press, but there are some things that press seems to think they have an absolute right to. They do gotcha. not have an absolute Thank right. Thank you much. Does your May 10th, 2017 memorandum instructing federal prosecutors to seek the most serious possible charges for criminal defendants and the longest possible sentences extend to defendants who are charged by special counsel Mueller, like Paul Manafort, Rick Gates, George Papadopoulos, and so on? Uh, I, I would think so. I haven't given that much thought. I would say it's not, it does not call for the most maximum sentence. It simply calls for charging the crime, uh, the most serious crime, and with the highest the sentence. minimum sentence for that most serious crime. Gotcha. Um, I was confused about one thing that came up in the various questioning about the meetings with Mr. Papadopoulos. At one point, I heard you to say that you told him essentially, no, don't go. You tried to shut it down, the trip. At another point, I thought I heard you to say, um, don't represent yourself as speaking for the campaign. And I'm just wondering whether you could clarify that. Were you telling him not to go or just not to go and officially speak for the Trump campaign? I have no specific. I remember the pushback. I remember that uh, he suggested an ability to negotiate uh, with Russians or others, and I thought he had no um, ability or it would not be appropriate for him to do so. And I was pretty clear about uh, that he, he shouldn't be uh, pretending to represent. You, were you equally clear with Mr. Gates at, at the June meeting not to go to Russia and not to represent the campaign? Or Mr. Page, rather. Mr. Page. Mr. Page, yeah. Um, well, uh, let me tell you what he says. Uh, I don't recall it. He says he was in the uh, uh, dinner, and as he walked out, uh, he told me I'm going to R Russia, that I made no response whatsoever. He said it looked like it went one ear and out the other, and that he did nothing improper when he went to Russia. So I don't know what he di did uh, and have no knowledge of it. He didn't report to me and uh, didn't act for me, and so far as I know, he didn't act for the campaign. Fair enough. Um, you've taken the position that members of Congress have no standing to sue in federal court to ch challenge President Trump's continuing receipt of foreign government payments at the Trump Hotel, the Trump Tower, the Trump Golf Courses, and so on. As Attorney General, our leading law enforcement official, what is the appropriate constitutional remedy 
for a president who collects foreign emoluments without obtaining congressional permission to do so as a matter of law? What is the appropriate remedy? I would have to take a look at that. I'm not prepared to give you an answer. All people have. Well, you've taken the position that we don't have any standing to raise it in court. So I guess what, what, what in, in taking that position that we don't have standing to raise it, what is the appropriate constitutional remedy? This was very serious business for the founders of the country who didn't want the president compromised by foreign government payoffs and by the intervention of foreign governments. So what do we do? The Emoluments Clause has not been a subject of a great deal of, of litigation. It, the Department of Justice has long-standing rules about standing and raise the defense of standing against Congress, against private parties, against groups, and um, it's pretty well established law. I'd have to get you information. Well, would you about clarify the that for question. us? Thank you. Um, so, as Attorney General, you said you'd be a defender of the voting rights of the people, and America faces a number of voting rights crises today. We've got millions of people who are disenfranchised in Puerto Rico and the other territories. We have 650,000 people right here in Washington, D.C., who have no voting representation in Congress. We've got continuing voter purges and suppression at the state level, and we've got warnings from our intelligence community that there will be further attempts at cyber sabotage of our elections. What do you consider the most serious threat to our voting rights, and what are you doing? About well, um, we will not accept uh, suppression and illegal activities against voters. So if you have any, I'd appreciate you sending it to me. We absolutely will. We will uh, make sure it's investigated by career attorneys in our civil rights division. And on the cybersecurity side, what are you doing to protect us from another hacking of our election attempt to uh, infiltrate with political sabotage, essentially? I believe uh, that this is a danger uh, that uh, I believe uh, investigations have been uh, ongoing and it's being considered. Uh, but I, Congressman, I have to say I'm not up to date on the latest of that. And I would be pleased to try to get you something in writing as to uh, what we need to do, at, or at least what we are doing and what we may need to do to protect the integrity of our elections. Thank you. You'll back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Attorney General, for being with us. I'd like to go back to some of your testimony on contacts with Russia. At the beginning in your opening statement, you said, my testimony has not changed. Um, later, in response to some questions, you said, I do now recall. And Mr. Attorney General, with all due respect, it's difficult to take your assurances under oath when you seem to change your testimony each time new evidence emerges, and specifically, you denied contact with Russians under oath during your confirmation hearings. That was revealed to be untrue, given multiple meetings with an ambassador. Later, you refined your response to more narrowly focus on discussion of campaign-related matters, but you denied that campaign surrogates communicated with Russian agents. That was revealed to be untrue, given the sworn statement offered by George Papadopoulos. You later again refined your answer, saying that you didn't remember Papadopoulos raising the issue in the March 2016 meeting, but once you remembered the meeting, you then remembered telling Papadopoulos to cease those conversations. Uh, you say that you cannot be expected to remember the details of what happened a year ago, but you are in fact a very seasoned prosecutor and a 20-year member of the United States Senate, uh, United States Congress, who is presumably capable of mind and memory. So, Attorney General Sessions, did you as a prosecutor accept a defense of lack of recall? Well, absolutely, people have a lack of recall. Thank you. Uh, we're and would in you, a uh, would you uh, environment that we were operating in with so much happening and meetings occurring. Um, you assume a lot of matters that aren't accurate. Thank I would you, Mr. Sessions. In the nature would you, of that instruct, question, the, would you instruct the attorneys who work for you at the Department of Justice to take at face value a defense of I don't recall? If a person says they don't recall and has a justified reason for it, I certainly do. And that was not the case in the uh, situation of the police officer that Mr. Jeffries referred to. Let me move on to um, another matter. On November 11th, President Trump not only trusted the word of Vladimir Putin over the brave men and women who serve in our intelligence community, he proceeded to trash the reputations of its leaders. And I quote here, he said, Give me a break, they are political hacks. 
The president went on to say that he believes that Vladimir, he believes Vladimir Putin when Putin says he absolutely did not meddle in our elections. Mr. Sessions, do you consider the leaders of our intelligence community, past and present, as political hacks? I would say to you, the president speaks his mind as he chooses. Is that a yes he or also no? says he is that a accepts yes or no? their uh, position. I'm not asking about I'm not the president, giving an, Mr. a yes Sessions. or no. I've given you my answer. So you, so you have no opinion on whether they're political hacks or not? I'm saying to you, I respect and uh, uh, value our intelligence community. Great. That's good to hear. And when President Trump said that he believes Vladimir Putin, when Putin says he absolutely did not meddle in our election, help me refresh my memory. In January of this year, was it the unanimous opinion of our intelligence community that the Russian government did, in fact, meddle in our election? I believe an opinion was expressed. That was a yes. I'm not aware of any uh, dissent from that. Okay, and to your knowledge, in the months since, has the intelligence community in any way changed its conclusion? I'm not aware of it. And on October 18th, when testifying before the Senate Judiciary Committee, Senator Sasse asked you if the department had taken adequate action to prevent election meddling in the future. You just said in response to some questions that you do believe this is a danger. Have you requested a review of what laws need to be updated in order to protect our elections from foreign interference? I have not, and would be pleased to work with you um, to uh, deal with the deficiencies we have. That's great. Be um, Congress would have to deal with that, not the have to pass the laws. You would want to appoint a special counsel on that issue? Uh, what, uh, maybe I misunderstood your question. What had special counsel? I thought you was asking, should we have laws, new laws, uh, to deal with? Well, I'm asking if you're going to investigate what has happened with the meddling in our elections. Well, that's part of the special prosecutor. Great. It's not, I'm, I'm, I'm not participating in that. He has Let me move on to for uh, Mr. Miller, because I just have a few seconds here. Um, considering your prominent role in the Trump campaign, did you work closely with and communicate with Stephen Miller when he worked on the campaign? Uh, I worked with him. He'd worked with me previously. Thank you. And did Mr. Miller tell you that he was working on a letter with President Trump, which detailed the president's reasons for firing then FBI Director Comey? Uh, Mr. Miller is a, um, a high government official uh, close to the President of the United States, and I'm not at liberty to reveal the na uh, nature of any conversations we may have had. Are you claiming executive privilege? I'm not then? claiming executive privilege. So I'm, I'm not following the long-established policies of the Department of Justice. The president has not invoked executive privilege, and so I understand your time of the gentlewoman has expired. To answer the <coughs> question, the point of parliamentary inquiry, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman will state his parliamentary inquiry. Is it, is there authority in this committee to permit a witness to refuse to answer a question without properly invoking a privilege? The, the and if not, what is the appropriate response from the chairman to enforce the committee's ability to do proper oversight? The uh, chair recognizes that uh, uh, senior <coughs> officials from both administrations, the current and past, and long standing before that, uh, have long stated the, uh, their uh, ability to not answer questions regarding communications at the highest level of our government. Well, Mr. Chairman, if I may be heard, I do not believe there is any such privilege or any right to assert a refusal to answer a question simply because the gentleman, it's The gentleman is not stating a parliamentary well, I'm inquiry. asking the, the chairman the to rule so suspend. we can appeal the ruling of the chair. If you're going to prevent us from getting answers to there, these questions. There is, there is no ruling of the chair. The gentleman well, then I would ask that the witness be directed to answer the gentlelady from Washington's questions. The, the, that is not a parliamentary inquiry. The gentlewoman from Georgia, Ms. Handel, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.